So how do you? Remember me? <laughs> what I'd like to do today is talk about how the Internet's talk turning upside down. And I'm going to stick in a side story because there's always something interesting happening in the world uh, about big data, open source, sounds boring so far, in the 19th century. That's when it gets interesting. About saving people's lives with big data and open source, about some amazing things and amazing ideas. So let's go on. I'm Ted Dunning, uh, Chief Applications Architect, and this is uh, kind of more of an open source talk, so hats off. Um, you can get some books that I've written with Ellen Friedman. There's four of them that we've written over the last year that includes a lot of the talk uh, that's in this, at least the substantive part. And uh, those are available courtesy of MAPAR. Uh, you can get them from the, the website. Uh, you can buy them as well, but uh, MAPAR has paid for the uh, right to give them away. So I'm going to talk about how the Internet is turning upside down. I'm going to divert a little bit for a cool story. And then I'm going to talk about what the implications are, especially the technical and economic implications of this inversion of how things are happening. Then I'm going to talk a bit about how NoSQL databases can be used to implement very high performance time series, especially for acquisition. Then a summary. Uh, so the, the Internet, there's, there's conservation laws on the Internet, or at least approximate conservation. If you stick bytes in one side, the same number of bytes have to come out somewhere else. That's the way streaming protocols work. Now, there is some lossage here. There's sometimes some replication and such. But that's the basic idea, is that you have bytes go in and bytes go out. And right now, the, the dominant consumer internet has a few things where the bytes go in and a lot of places where it comes out. And that has the obvious consequence that the places that the, the the bytes come out. This is kind of a schematic of how the internet is designed. It's not exact, obviously, because it fits on one page. But there's so many more consumers consuming data than there are servers feeding the data that we can tell immediately that the technology intensity is going to be very hot on the left and much cooler on the right. The dollar density is going to be much higher on the left and the dollar density is going to be much lower on the right. On the other hand, the total amount of money spent is dominantly on the right side. That last mile problem, the problem of getting the bits to those individual consumers, because there are so many consumers, billions, makes the total cost of that last mile very high. So we can see that this bit conservation and the fact there's lots of consumers tells us already the shape of the Internet, the shape of how the economics of the Internet is. The, the problems to be faced there are speed, how much data can we push through, end-to-end -end latency, backbone bandwidth, things like that. Is it feasible even to build per consumer types of Internet? That, that was a big question once upon a time. And the way we do that is we build good caches. The caches take some bits out, and then they inject them back in multiple times. We preserve conservation of bits, but those, those devices um, are able to move the bits closer and then reuse those bits. But before we get into those real implications there, I want to go off script here a little bit and talk about one of the coolest stories I've heard in a very long time. Uh, this is about, as I said, big data, open source in the 19th century. And being that it's in the 19th century, being the way they did things there, it's about things like this. This is a, a ship that's a replica of an early 19th century uh, vessel. This is the ship that was used in the movie Master and Commander. It's now down in San Diego. And ships like that had prescribed routes that were decided by the captain. But if you think about it, the captains from New York to San Francisco took almost six months. To come back would take about the same amount of time. So if you're making voyages like that, you could make a voyage per year. 
If you were a captain for 10 years, maybe 20, if you were very successful, you would make 20 voyages as captain. You might have made 10 or 15 voyages before that, but you're talking about having seen a particular part of the ocean at most something like 30 times. You would not see it in different seasons. You would not see areas that were just 300 miles away. And so you would not know if there's better weather nearby or if there should be better weather or where the currents would be if you were off that course. You would only know what you had seen and a few stories from friends of yours. You would know very, very little about the ocean in spite of spending almost all of your adult life on the ocean. That meant that these guys were very, very conservative about how they went. They went the way they had gone because that's the way they knew because if they didn't do that, they could die like that. It's not a risk that you and I face if we make a mistake. I mean, ooh, semicolon missing. It's not a big deal. These guys could die. The, the, even when the death rate had been decreased dramatically on sailing ships, the, the Germans still ran sailing ships from Hamburg to Chile in the 20s, and the death rate on those voyages was about 5% of the crew per voyage more dangerous than what we do. In the 1840s, it took, as I said, five to six months to go all the way down around the Horn and to San Francisco. The record was around 130 days. The, the voyages took various routes, but how exactly you chose to go from New York to San Francisco would determine a lot about how fast you went. People tended to hug the coast of South America and then come straight up the gap there, but come up pretty straight into Hawaii. In 1851, in 1850 actually, uh, the record was set at 89, 89 and a half days by this ship called the, the Flying Cloud, from 130 days to 89 and a half in just a few years. Ship technology had not changed. The knowledge of the captains, you know, the, the amount of experience they had hadn't really changed. The way that they made rope, the way they pulled on ropes, the way they made sails had not changed. The difference was big data. That's what cut that record from 130 days to 89 days. That record, by the way, stood for 130 years till the late 80s, 1980s. It was an amazing thing to do. And it was a primitive kind of time series database, a primitive kind of recommendation engine that's what let these guys cut that much time, 40 or 50 days off of the normal time for going there. Here's a picture of a log. This is the log of the steamship Bear steaming to the Arctic in the 1890s to rescue the Greeley expedition from Greenland, I believe. And you can see that there's times on the far left and you can see in the first column to the right of the times, they have something labeled knots, and you can see seven, 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 eight. So every hour they would measure their speed. Next one over, they would measure the, the depth, five fathoms zero. So that's fathom is six or seven feet, I think. And then the next is the number of feet below the fathom. Uh, the next one, course steered, that's directions, but it's in a little bit difficult form for us to read. It's still a direction, which is a number. It's just in funny form. The wind direction and so on, they measured all these things about once an hour. But the particular form of this log is called a Mori, M-A-U-R-Y, a Mori abstract log. It's named after this guy, Matthew Mori, who in the 18, late 1840s started making charts like this. And the reason he started making charts like this is because he'd been in a carriage accident. I mean, you do things for odd reasons. He had been a U.S. naval officer at sea. He was injured in a carriage accident and crippled in a way that he could never go to sea again because he wasn't high enough ranking. It's not like Nelson. Nelson could have people who would bring food to him or, or pull on a rope or things like that. But a junior officer, if he was maimed or crippled, could never go to sea again. So he was assigned to the U.S. Naval Observatory, and he found thousands of logs that had been deposited there. These were narrative logs, not abstract logs. Narrative in that they would tell stories. They would say, for breakfast we had this, or here's a picture of the island we saw, and there's a whale. 
And they actually had pictures like that in the logs. They, would, they were bored, I guess. There's nothing to do when you've set the sails and you're just going along. Might as well draw a picture in the log. But they put measurements of what they saw at each ringing of the bell. And they put measurements every hour when they would turn over four, four time measurements. And so he reduced those measurements and put them on charts like this. This is Florida, the, the North Atlantic. And you can see as we zoom in here, all of those lines, those lines are voyages of ships as recorded in those logs. And each day, he would draw a little fuff. Those record the winds that they saw that day. Fairly consistent for the most part, but you can see a red one on the left where there's kind of a spray. You can see red arrows. There's one on the left there that has a nine next to it. I can point to it there. I doubt I can point to it, but roughly in that area. That arrow me measures the current. By dead reckoning, the people know which way they were sailing, how much leeway they should have, but then they would measure their position at the end of the day so they knew what the current was. That's a pretty simple computation, as long as you don't have to do it without a computer, like these guys did. You can also see uh, water temperatures. There's one on the right over here. Those are numbers with a line under it. The different colors, red represents summer, green represents spring, black winter. The dashed and the dotted and the solid lines represent the month of the season. There's a huge amount of information here. You can see which year, what kind of ship, what they saw, how much wind they saw, was it variable? And you can see it over a worldwide scale. The first major use of these was by a game named Jackson. He sailed from Baltimore to Rio de Janeiro. It's a 50 some odd day trip. He cut 17 days off the trip time, off the best trip time. On the way back, he cut 18 days off the best trip time. He arrived over a month early People didn't believe he'd gone to Rio. They thought he'd gone somewhere else by accident. But he had the post, so they knew it was correct. So he had cut an enormous 40% time off this voyage by using these charts. He was the first one to really use these. Up to that point, nobody would use them. That's not the way we do it. It's not a relational database. They didn't say the last part. But they were very, very much sticks in the mud because up to that point, People would die if they tried new things. They would die. And so this is a really scary thing to try to take on. But the rewards were huge. 40% of the time at sea is a big advantage, even if you don't really want to go ashore. It's a big economic advantage. Now, the cool thing is Maury gave away these charts for free. He didn't charge for them. You had to fill out abstract logs, like the log we saw, and give it to his agents to be reduced and put into the next charts. And that way, you would get the logs for free, or the charts. It was open source. It was crowdsourced. And it's a recommendation system. If you look at it, people who sailed here often got this wind. It's, it's a nearest neighbor approximate. It's data mining. It's, it's all of this stuff we talk about now as if we had invented it. Just 160 years later, we invented it. It's kind of like, oh, I wrote this poem this morning. Uh, oh, yeah, Shakespeare wrote it a long time ago, but I wrote it this morning. Uh, it's kind of on the same level of invention. This was scary stuff. This was people dying or not. This is pretty cool. Uh, this cut the death rates of sailors dramatically, cut the voyage times dramatically. It enabled new kinds of business. It's a big deal. Charts like this are still used today. They don't look the same because they're now there's so much data, you have to present it differently. So it's visualization too. It's, it's, like, it's like everything we do, those guys were doing with pen and ink and engravings. By the end of the century, that project had collected over a billion data points. Think about writing that by hand and then scribing it in. And that data set is still available online. And it's now used for meteorological applications. There's a oldweather.org is pulling weather measurements out of old narrative logs and out of the Mori data so that we can make better maps and so we can understand what's happening now. So this is. It's like I said, it's just such a cool story. Time series, yeah, but 
The real reason I want to tell it is because it's a cool story. So let's go on. Let's talk about what's changed and where will it lead. What does this teach us about what we're doing? And we talked about how the internet was, but things are changing. If you look at it here, just to the left of that pipe, you see the sensor? No, I don't either. But uh, you also see weather sensors. You see uh, jet engines now come with a data plan. It's kind of like your phone. Uh, they cost more with a data plan, just like your phone. Uh, jet engines are worth about 20% more in terms of purchase price if they have a data plan. That's because you can, the manufacturer can predict what's going to happen. Uh, alternative energy is big on data because every one of those is making multiple measurements and the upstream and downstream conditions help you tune how the, uh, the wind farm is, is built. Normal power generation has measurements, but the consumption has measurements. I was hiking in Big Basin Redwood Forest, in the middle of the woods, we found a smart meter. I don't know what it was metering, you know, I, redwoods don't normally consume much energy, but uh, it was metering it, and it was sending it to galactic headquarters somewhere. So there's all of these things. Every one of those containers typically has multiple measuring devices in it. The ship itself collects all that data, and then when it comes to, to the harbor, it emits the data. Uh, telephone systems are, of course, doing data. Uh, but they're also being used to measure weather because you can tell from the propagation characteristics what uh, local meteorological characteristics are. They also measure, of course, traffic. Cars uh, measure, trains measure. Actually, trains measure stations, stations measure trains. Uh, that's kind of cool. The guys on the left in this picture are talking about measuring every seed that's planted in fields as it grows or doesn't measuring the amount of water every one of those gets, every condition it has. So big data growing, as it were. Uh, so the thing that's changed is things. Even in this room, there are probably more things emitting data than there are people, consumers. There are more things than there are consumers. How many people have a phone? How odd, everybody. How many people have a computer? Oh, they win. It's, it's over. Uh, the things win. The, just even in this room, just bam, like that. So these things are emitting data. How often does your phone emit data? Every 30 seconds or so. It talks to the central. Well, mine doesn't because it's on airplane mode. I'm sure that that stops it. Um, <laughs> so the, the situation is that the internet is changing. The things outnumber us. There are more of them than there are of us. And that's changing this idea that a few servers are emitting data to a lot of consumers into this. A massive number of machines are emitting data to go to servers. The internet is turning upside down or inside out or backwards to front, whatever you want to call it. The internet is fundamentally inverting. It's a revolution. It's really big change. And the money is going to be massive on the left, smaller on the right, although the money density will be very high on the, on the right. You're, you're seeing this revolution in things. That's a consumer-grade flow measurement device. That's a full six-axis inertial navigation system for $14.95 in quantities of one. So you're getting this possibility that you can measure things for very, very little money. Ha. He's not watching, but I can refer to him. Matthias over there works for a company that has clothes that measure you. Not the man measured to make the suit, but the suit measuring the man, turning it inside out. The second step is also getting much, much cheaper. The one in the front is a Beagle Bone. The one in the back is an Arduino Pro Mini, seven and a half dollars in quantities of one. The prices are dropping dramatically. Now, there are different problems than in the consumer internet. There's, there's a lot of stuff to do, but there's very little power to do it in. Very little computing power, very little bandwidth, and things like that. Mesh networks have very low bandwidths, uh, relatively speaking. And fundamentally, the source is the problem. We have a first mile problem instead of a last mile problem. 
And one of the important things we need to do is build time series databases. That's the central function of this. And a lot of people say you don't need the high resolution data in a central facility. But in fact, that's true only in the past. Right now, what's happening is people are more and more building high resolution models about detecting failure. You cannot build that remotely. You have the data, the high resolution data, near the source of the data. But to build the model, you have to look across many, many, many of those machines. So you need a central point where all of that high resolution data can be collected and you can build models. And so we have to build time series data bases that meet the needs here. And the needs are prodigious. We need to have queries by different forms, although very limited ways, not general queries of the sort we need from ordinary databases. We need a, a few different kinds of queries. And we can try a few different ways of storing it, but this relational, non-relational system really, really, really can cook most of the others. I'll show you one of the reasons why. Let's take a specific example. This is a data center. It emits maybe 100 to 10,000 machines. They're going to emit uh, 10,000 samples per second. Sounds fast. But this is also on the order of what a single race car in Formula One emits, roughly 10,000 measurements a second. Total, well, actually, it's more than that, but it's a total of around uh, 12 megabytes per second. Uh, and this is what a system called OpenTSDB was designed to handle at this thing. It was an install and go and deal with DevOps as you go sort of system. But let's look at a different one. Uh, take oil. If you screw up because you didn't analyze your time series well enough with an oil rig, you stand to fill a good part of the Gulf of Mexico with oil. The screw ups are really massive massively expensive. And so people try to be very, very careful about how they do these things. How much data? Well, 100 rigs is a typical drilling project at 10,000 samples per second. That's a million data points per second. That's much faster than the data center. But much, much worse is these guys want to test the system on a full load. They're not willing to just say, eh, yeah, it works today, probably work tomorrow. We'll fix it if it doesn't. That this is not an acceptable attitude or methodology. They want to test ahead of time. So they want to take three years of data, say, ingest it, and run some tests. And they don't want the test to take three years. So they want to ingest the data in a day or so, uh, maybe a few days, 100, 1,000 times real time. So the million samples per second suddenly becomes 100 million samples per second or a billion samples per second just without even turning around. That's how fast we actually have to ingest data into these databases. Typical relational system, if you're putting it in with a conventional sort of schema, it's gonna take you know many thousands per second, maybe 100,000 per second. Well, this is a far, far cry from what we need to do. Four orders of magnitude too slow. So what we want to do is we want to build some sort of system that collects messages, collects things together in a standard thing, throws them into a table, and then has a web service and can give users a happy experience. Uh, in OpenTSDB, messages look like this. They have times, they have metrics, they have keys and values along with a particular value. It's a little bit hard to see there's a space over here between the time and the value. All of the pieces there. So what we did is we took the standard TSDB, which consists of little bitty collectors out there in the wild, time series demons in the middle, the green parts, and the red part at the bottom, which stores the data in an HBase-like database. And this is the way it works. It, it normally stores data like this, where each time window gets samples so an entire row stores data for an entire time window, but the columns are named according to the time offset in the window. This is weird. This is not relational. This is not what they teach you in school because normally you define a schema ahead of time. 
what are all the possible offsets in the time window? I don't know. Depends on how long the time window is. Depends on your time resolution. So you cannot know ahead of time what the columns are. You can't write the schema for this database. Now, it's really cool on retrieval because you can retrieve a row and get a whole bunch of data at one time. That's nice. It's not so good on insert because every insert requires a database operation. Even a parallel database, you know, if it's going to run 50,000 per second per node, you're going to have to have a lot of nodes to get a billion a second. So what they do is to enhance retrieval, they blob the data. They put basically a little subtable into a value there that's a columnar sort of storage, and that compacts the data. It, it reduces the amount of actual keys and values that are stored in the database. That makes it better. Well, what we can do here is uh, 20,000 samples per second per node. Uh, we could do better on a higher performance cluster. This isn't fast enough. So the architecture here where hourly that blob is accumulated, that's the gray section there. What we do is we change that. We can put that blob accumulator in line into the thing that puts it, the data in the database. What this means is we can cache the data in memory, and then once every time window, we put a blob in. This decreases the database transaction rate by however many samples are in the time window, commonly by 1,000x. So we've suddenly made things much, much faster. Now we have risk that we have here. We have an in-memory cache. We could lose that cache. So the countermeasure to that is we fill the cache from a replayable buffer. The replayable buffer, we mark the time in the buffer, the offset in the buffer, when we start accumulating data in memory. So if we lose that cache, we can go back to that point and refill memory. That means that the renderer, which is at the bottom, can read from the in-memory buffer and from the database and can render data that's up to the second, but we still have reduced the number of transactions to the database. So 3,600 sam samples, say, or 1,000 or whatever it takes, on our engineering cluster, our, our development cluster, which is a tiny thing, with one edge node and four cluster nodes, that's all administrative and data things together, we got about 14 million samples per second observed. This is on gigabit networking. It's not on performance hardware at all. And then on a performance cluster, running up to, to nine nodes in the, in the cluster and a number of ingest nodes, you have to punch the data in somehow. We got over 100 million data samples for four nodes and over 200 million for eight nodes and almost 300 on nine nodes. So we can now meet these requirements pretty straightforwardly. Now, there's, there's other things we probably want to do. We want to go further. We want to do more interesting things. We want to do microsecond resolution. It may be required that we have to go beyond how TS, OpenTSDB works. But the basic ideas are really pretty sound. Uh, we can compress and batch at the collectors, if possible, keeping the in-memory if we need to do it. We can compress and batch at the source if we don't need exact real time. And we want to interface with Apache Drill or other query systems that people need. Drill can look at these uh, in-memory blobs or, the, or these columnized pieces there. So in, in this adjusted system, we will only ever see blobs with columnar data in there. Drill can take that, zip those things together, and produce what looks like the ordinary relational data from that. So there's a lot of stuff to do. And here's an example of how much better we can do. If we're keeping 64-bit microsecond time samples, and we're going from a typical industrial system sampling at 10,000 samples per second and with very low jitter, the jitter is down here on this axis, on the horizontal axis. So if we're doing 100 microsecond samples with less than five microseconds of jitter in the sample time, you can see that the timestamp will only require less than six bits to store in this columnar format. So it doesn't even cost us anything to go to roughly microsecond resolution. We can measure these things and 
still not have very much storage in the columnar format. So the key results here are networks are still are now the bound, both at the ingestion side and in the time series size. That's how fast we can do it. We can saturate multiple 10 gigabit links in ingesting data into a time series with full resolution and full fidelity and full queryability. With enough edge nodes, it scales. It's just perforce. The raw open TSDB is limited by the stateless daemon. We need to introduce state to make it faster, but we can make it much faster. Here, for instance, are the actual results. These are the raw speeds. The error bars show you uh, we didn't run the eight node test very long. And you see on the blue run, which is two ingesters, there's a fall off at about eight nodes in terms of performance. On the one ingester, you don't see a fall off, but if I normalize by the number of nodes, you can see at four nodes, the single ingester is losing performance per data node. It was 30 mega, mega samples per second, and it drops. And so what's happening there is the ingester is limiting the speed. The database is not. When we have two ingesters, it goes to two times four, roughly, before we see fall off. So the system is scaling essentially perfectly linearly. And with MapR, it works like a champ. I haven't tried it on HBase. Uh, I think it would be interesting, but not as high a performance. Now, there's times when it's not right, but there's times when this is very, very right. Uh, in industrial settings especially, data rates from individual sensors are high, and this should be a very, very good system for that. So here's a summary. The internet is turning upside down. It's inevitable. We can't change it. This will make time series an absolutely ubiquitous data structure. Current up open source systems, where well, we donated these changes back to OpenTSDB, but we still need to drive those performance levels higher. We can fix that. And it's really not even that hard. Are there any questions? Does anybody want to do this? This is kind of the end of the day. It's been a long day. It's a long day for me. Long day for you, I'm sure. Anybody want to do this? Anybody does this? I know somebody does this. There's some microphones there if you'd like to ask a question. The summary again. The performance. That one. These are the same slide, just divided differently. This one. OK. Ah, the pictures. You know, the slides are going to be available very shortly. And in fact, I imagine that they've already been tweeted uh, because Chris ran out of the room. He had a copy of the slides. So you'll be able to get all these slides online. Are there other questions? People have had a I do, to... Ted. Right here. Hey, there you are, Herbert. <laughs> Matthias. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, the performance you're actually putting forward is about data points per second. Uh, how many different sensors do you actually have? Because part of the performance of OpenTSDB relies on, you know, assigning UIDs for tags, for metrics. And I think in the, in the volume you're actually showing here, they're probably from a limited set of sensors. Am I right? Uh, this was uh, this was not from a million sensors. This was from roughly 10,000 to 100,000 sensors. And your data were actually ordered by sensor or just by timestamp? The the data in the database is ordered according to the way that OpenTSDB does it, which is metric first. So that would give a lot of diversity there, and then time window is the second element in the key. Okay. So there would be lots of parallelism in the ingest path. And on the ingestion part, you were actually able to do those blobs uh, because the, the data were belonging to a common sensor when they were actually coming in, right? No, they were coming. There were lots of accumulators in memory. Okay. So from a very large number of machines. Obviously, if you're accumulating 1,000 points per sensor, you need 10, 20, 30 kilobytes per sensor of accumulation space, depending on how much compression you get in your accumulation. If you have 1,000 of those, that's 10, 20, 30 megabytes. If you have a million of them, it's 10, 20, 30 gigabytes. 
of RAM, but that's not a very big number anymore. So uh, up to millions of sensors, this is very, very easy to accumulate. You have severe uh, non-locality of memory because you're accumulating from many, many different sources. Typically, the way we would do this is we would do a, uh, a localized accumulator just into ordered memory, do a sort, and then batchwise accumulates. And, and did you time the actual parsing of the input, or did you yeah. use the, the, the text format of OpenTSDB, or? Yes. OK. So this is, this is using with horrific levels of text formatting and deformatting in here. OK. Thanks. Yeah. But if, if you do slightly more clever things, you can obviously cut down a lot of these things. Even so, we were driving to what the databases would do and what the network interface on the ingest node could do. So the, the, the other considerations were not coming into play. Yeah? Can you please explain the plotting again? I'm sure. Yeah, it, 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 and probably without the diagram, it'll be even easier, which is probably a measure of a bad diagram. But the idea is that we have many samples in a time window. And so I'm going to build a data structure which has a list of the times for the samples and a list of the values. I, I could store it in JSON. That's a fine way to store it. It's a bit expensive because it's textual. I could also use just a binary array. And then I could compress the, the array of times and the array of samples separately. The array of times can be sam compressed very nicely by taking successive differences in times building a dictionary of what differences we see. There will be only a few differences because the, the jitter is typically low. The jitter is high if we have very few samples. The jitter is low if we have very many samples because it'll be a highly periodic sim. So the index into the dictionary is a very small integer. We can encode that using standard variable by variable bit encoding techniques and we get very tight encoding. The signal storage is from industrial things, typically 12 or 16 bits. It can be compressed typically to less than eight bits, not as much as the timestamp usually. In many other situations, uh, you can compress it less, but it's sampled less often as well. So you, you have these trade-offs of total bandwidth, high frequency, highly regular things compress well, less regular, longer time scales compress less well, but there's less data. Sure. Everybody ready to run off to the party or get some beer or something like that? I'll be available, obviously, by Twitter, by email. Uh, I'll be around tomorrow. I've got one more talk to give. Uh, and I'll be at the MapR booth uh, some of the day as well. So thank you very, very much for coming.